you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 16. We are on the last uh, chapter here in the book of Romans. Last week, we were able to work through the first seven verses. We kind of divided up this greeting, the salutation that Paul had to uh, some saints here. And we're going to pick up in verse 8. Romans chapter 16, beginning in verse 8. Greet Amplius, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachus. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aerostubulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow countrymen. Greet those who belong to the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have worked hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Greet Ansicritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, and Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send you greetings. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you shine down upon us, Lord, as we sang this wonderful song. Shine on us, Lord. We ask that today as we hear your word. Take away the distractions that might cause us not to think upon you. Give us eyes for you and you alone, ears for you and you alone. Help each person to hear what you would be saying to them in their own language. We ask that you do that in the name of Jesus, the Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul was a man with many friends. His heart embraced all the people of God, and his love for them provoked him to a keen interest in them. Somehow in a day and an age which knew nothing of modern communication, Paul was able to keep in touch with the universal church. So Paul was able to keep himself abreast and informed of the state of the church in Rome. He knew many of the leading Christians by name. They were all down in his prayer list and his prayer book. And now he checks them off one by one as he draws this epistle to a close. And last week we checked off the first seven verses and we're picking up here in verses 8 and 9. Greet Amplius, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend, Stachus. Now, to be loved by the Apostle Paul, to be counted as one of his helpers, these are distinctions that are indeed these unknown saints flash for a moment in the reflected light of Paul's greatness. Yet the humblest of the children of God Beloved by the Lord and one of his helpers is just as surely known, is just as surely honored and remembered. The day is coming when each one will be given a place in the sun to reflect his glory, the glory of God for every eye to see for all of the ages of eternity. These are greeted by Paul for a reason, but all those that are in Christ will be greeted by the Lord one day. Verse 10, greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Now here is a saint who had won his spurs. Now he had some way been put to the test, and he had won the approval of his brethren. It's instructive, though, to take note of, of how this word approved is used elsewhere in the New Testament. First, it's rendered, passes the test in James chapter 1, verse 12, that says, a man who endures trials is blessed 
because when he passes the test or is approved, approved, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So when we endure trials and we pass the test, whatever that test may be from the Lord, we are approved of God. Paul uses the same word in his discussion of a believer's attitude toward the weaker brother. And here in Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The man who looks to his brother's interest and who recognizes that will win the approval of his brethren. Paul says in verse 18 of that same chapter, chapter 14 here in the book of Romans, whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and approved by men. Those who realize that this is not about the flesh, our old nature, it is about Christ and spiritual things are acceptable to God and also approved to men or by men. Writing to the Corinthians, the apostle says, there must indeed be factions among you so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. There are factions among you so that we can see those that are approved. We know too that there were heresies here threatening the saints at Rome because later in this chapter, and we'll pick up on that next week, Paul tells the believers how to handle false teachers. Another essential of winning approval is modesty about one's own accomplishments. 2 Corinthians 10, 18 says, For it is not the one commending himself who is approved, but the one the Lord commends. Those that are approved are those that the Lord commends, not me commending myself, telling you how great I am. That won't cut it. It's who the Lord approves. Now, in his last letter written to young Timothy, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. The same Greek word for approved is used in each of the above examples. In some such way, perhaps Apelles was raised to a place in the esteem of his brethren. These are ways open to any of God's people. First and foremost, to be approved to God, you must come through God's Son, Jesus Christ. That's the only way that you'll ever be approved to God. And then to be approved to those around us, other believers, we must live out that Christian life day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour, year by year. The second part of verse 10 through verse 11 says, Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodias, my fellow countrymen. Greet those who belong to the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. In both the above instances, the word household does not appear in the original manuscript a fact which is evident in the authorized version where the word occurs in italics, indicating, it, indicating that it had been supplied by those who translated it. Because of this, the suggestion has been made that those greeted were the household slaves of Aristobulus and uh, Narcissus, and that it does not necessarily follow that either of these men were themselves Christians, J.B., Lightfoot maintained that Aristobulus should be identified as the grandson of Herod the Great, brother of Herod Agrippa of Judea. Alfred discusses the possibility of Narcissus being a well-known freeman of Claudius while concluding that this could hardly be true because that particular Narcissus was executed in the very beginning of Nero's reign and prior to the writing of the book of Romans. He does admit the possibility that the family of Narcissus could still be known by this name even after his death. Herodian probably belonged to Herod, the family of Herod also, and was a fellow countryman of Paul. That is, he was a Jew. Verse 12, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa who have worked hard in the Lord 
Greet my dear friend Persis, who has worked very hard in the Lord. Tryphena and Tryphosa were most likely sisters. And Paul says of Persis, my dear friend, can you imagine being called the dear friend of the apostle, this great man of God? Persis is uh, mentioned as his dear friend. Verse 13, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother and mine. This Rufus may have been the son of the Simon, of the, uh, the Simon the Cyrenian, the man who carried the cross for Christ. Certainly Mark, who wrote his gospel for the Romans, described Simon as the father of Alexander and Rufus, the likelihood being that this man was the Rufus known in the Roman church. Possibly, too, Simon of Cyrene was the same Simon mentioned in Acts 13, verse 1, as one of the elders of the Antioch church who played a part in commending Paul and Barnabas to the mission field. F.F. Bruce suggests that Paul's reference in Romans to Rufus, his mother and mine, might possibly refer to Paul's days in Antioch when perhaps he was the guest in their home. Dan Crawford, in commenting on the Lord's promise, he said, I assure you, Jesus said, there is no one who has left house, brothers or sisters, mother or father, children or fields, because of me and the gospel who will not receive a hundred times or a hundredfold more. Now at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. Now Dan Crawford quaintly says, all along the line of pursuit, devil's hue and cry notwithstanding, the saint has been the gainer, here finding a fresh mother and there a whole Bethany of sisters and brothers. Rufus may have a mother, but Paul says she is his mother and mine. One of Paul's 20,000 mothers. Is not this the whole purport of Romans 16, yea, this the pre precise divine reason for the long list of friends recorded there, and this to show how wisely and how well Christ has kept that old hundredfold promise to his own children. Verse 14, greet Ensecritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patriobs, and Hermes, and the brothers who are with them. One group of saints met in the house of Priscilla and Aquila. And here's the second group meeting in like simplicity. Verse 15, greet Philologus and Julia, uh, Nereus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. And some have thought that Philologus and Julia were husband and wife and that Nereus and his sister were their children while Olympus was of the same family household this is the third assembly of believers in Rome mentioned in this chapter. And with this group, Paul brings his salutations to the Roman Christians to a close. He has, however, one more thing to say. Having greeted them with love's uniqueness, he suggests a practical way love can be shown. Uniquely, he has greeted each of these individuals. And now he wants to show us a practical way to show love. In verse 16, the apostle greets them with love's affection. Love is not cold. Love is not formal. Love is warm. Love is affectionate. And so the apostle says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send you greetings. This direction is repeated five times in the New Testament here in 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 Thessalonians 5, and 1 Peter 5. In the East, a kiss was, and it is a sign of respect and affection. It was the traditional Oriental greeting, but it would be wrong to dismiss the injunction merely as something done in the Orient. A hearty handshake would give the idea in our culture. A warm hand clasp conveys the idea of love and respect, fellowship and warmth. It is just this that Paul had in his mind. This page of worthies is no more 
uh, or no mere relic from the past. As Bishop Mool writes, it is a list of friendships to be made hereafter and to be possessed forever in the endless life where personality indeed shall be eternal, but where also the union of personalities in Christ shall be beyond our utmost present thought. Friendship of the saints. And as we have worked our way through the greetings to Roman Christians, we think about this. We think about what it means to have the friendship of the saints. Now, I've been here close to two years, and I've talked an awful lot about the word love. The Bible is clear on love, that it's patient, that it's kind. It doesn't hold a long record of wrongs against it. It's not rude. It's selfless. But love needs to be taken a step further, if that's possible. Friendship. What does it mean to be friends? To truly care about one another. To gather together. And I want to talk about the friendship of the local church is what I want to talk about. There was a lady recently, and I don't remember if it was last week. I don't think it was last week. I believe it was the week before on a Sunday night. Normally Sunday mornings I dominate the conversation, so I don't imagine it was a Sunday morning. I assume it was a Sunday night. And she made a statement. He said, I, uh, when I'm gone from here, I go to a couple of churches in another area, another town. And these are large churches. He said, I walk into one of these churches, and it's very cold there. People are not really friendly. You know, they kind of sit there, and they eyeball you, and just not real friendly. And she said, then I go across town to another church. And in that church, the people are, uh, are overwhelmingly friendly. They're so nice. They can't get over themselves to get to you, to shake your hand, and to say hi to you. Very loving. She said there's massive difference between these two churches. And something that she said, and she's not here this morning, so, uh, and I won't say her name, so I can't embarrass her. She's not here. But she said, when I come here, when I'm in town and I'm here, she said it's the same here. The friendship, the love, the compassion, the kindness. We are small in number, but we can be friendly to one another. We can be friendly to others. Now, I don't want us to just be a friendship of us and to them on the outside. When people come in, we need to jump to it as quick as we can, show them the love of God, the compassion of God in our lives. That's not an easy thing. It means we have to step out of our comfort zone and sometimes that's not comfortable. I know. Believe you me, I know that. But we have to do it. Because what is love? It's compassion. It's kindness. It's graciousness. It's reaching out to people even when I don't feel like it. And that's hard. But we must do it. We must reach those who need us. I had an opportunity this week, and this is kind of off subject, but I didn't have an opportunity to tell everybody. I've told some people the story, but I had an opportunity this week to go up and preach at a funeral. Anna Edmonds, and some of you may know her. I know some of you do know who she was. She was 98. She passed on, and I got the call on Tuesday, and I was sick, and I was so sick from this past weekend. Uh, I, I I caught what most many of you have had and have. And so I wasn't real excited when I got the call, but I graciously, as graciously as I could possibly muster, said I would do it. And it wasn't until Thursday that I would officiate the, the funeral service. And they began to tell me who it was, and I had no idea who this person was. And they said, well, she knows you from teaching up at the Hester home. And I said, okay, well, uh, but I didn't know who she was. So I planned for this funeral. I planned a message, and I made sure I planned a message because I didn't know if she was a Christian or not. And it was interesting. They had already sent me uh, the obituary, and nowhere did it say what church she was a part of or anything like that, and 
nothing about her being a Christian, and so I was kind of shocked by that. And then I talked to the brother. The brother never said anything about her being a believer, any church that she attended when she was younger, or anything like that. And so I was a little shocked. And so I was preparing to go and preach someone who I assumed was lost, probably in hell at that moment. Well, I get up to the, to the funeral home, and I'm there, and I go and spend some time with the family. And as soon as I walk in, I notice, uh, a lady who looked like she wanted to say something, and so I walked over and began to talk to her. And one of the first words out of her mouth was that Ona was a born-again believer. And I just lit up. And I was feeling bad, and I really didn't want to be in that room. I was just going to kind of hide off by myself and then do the funeral when it was time and then disappear with my plan. I didn't want to get anybody sick, and I didn't want to be any sicker. But it lit me up, and I was so excited. And I thought about the message. The message was a strong, strong, uh, get saved message, kind of message. And, and so I was prepared for it. And I thought, well, this is awesome. Now I can use Anna. And I could say, Anna would want this. What else could she possibly want as she's facing our Lord and Savior than me to talk about Christ? She didn't want me to talk about her life. All of the meaningless things that we do throughout our life, and I know they're not, and believe you me, I didn't stand up there and say that. I don't mean that that way. But the things that I've done in my life, for you to stand up here when I die and, and talk about them are meaningless. I want you to talk about Christ. That's all that matters, and that's all that someone who is with Christ would want you to talk about. And I think about TV, and if you're, if you're a sports fan, how many sports figures die and you'll hear the commentators, and they'll say, well, he would have wanted us to play this game. He would have wanted us to talk about football. No, he would not. He wouldn't want you to think anything about football. He'd want you to think about Christ. Christ is all that matters. And so praise the Lord for this woman's salvation, and that I could stand up there and proclaim, and I know there were lost members within the family there, and I could see it on their face. And I began to preach harder and harder. My voice wasn't real strong, but I was screaming as loud as I could that we must come to Christ. We must receive him like Anna did. And we will spend eternity with Christ and with Anna for all eternity. There's nothing more important. I was trying to get that message across to the people there. There's nothing more important. You can't tell me there is than this. Christ Jesus and him alone. And remember, Paul said, I don't come with persuasive speech. I don't come with all of the eloquent words. I just come preaching Christ and him crucified. I don't know anything else. I don't want to know anything else. Bringing that back, back to friendship. I may not have known Anna Edmonds, but one day I will be with her in heaven, and I will know her. And we are friends. And if we are in Christ and we're Christian, we're all friends. And we're to love one another. Let us love one another. The front is always open if you want to come and spend time in prayer. We have a final song, a final hymn. Bill, if you want to come forward.